to all our viewers who are watching us live. This is www.techmaketv. My name is Tony. We're so much excited to have you once more again. It's fresh new year since uh, the COVID pandemic and this is the first show that we're going to be hosting for you guys. We were talking it's just nothing but Zimbabwean politics. Today we are so much excited to have Zimbabweans who are making and breaking or all breaking Zimbabwean political landscape as it is. We are so much excited. I'll be introducing to you very soon uh, uh, the guest that we've got here today for this show is we discuss Zimbabwean political landscape. Today we're going to be discussing about we're going to be discussing more importantly on the state of opposition players or alternative players, so is it is uh, in Zimbabwe. Do we still really have them? Have they been captured? Do we have independent political voices in Zimbabwe? Quickly, uh, to my left, I've got an independent uh, candidate, Honorable Tema Muliswa. Uh, thank you so much, Honorable, for taking your time to have us here right here. Thank you, too. Pleasure. A point of correction, only independent. <laughs> the only independent, the only independent country that we've got here in Zimbabwe, of course. And as well, to my right, uh, we've got from the MDC Alliance, uh, Honorable Tima. Thank you so much for joining us live right here. Thank you, Tom. Right, great. Uh, as we kick off this show, uh, it looks like Mr. Bliswa is already ready and is uh, is wearing gloves off as the only independent uh, candidate uh, in Zimbabwe uh, uh, politics as it is. Uh, Honorable Mlesko, many people have asked and questioned your independence. You seem to be an independent candidate in the parliament who is more pro ZANU PF. And people are questioning your independence. How independent is uh, Temba Mlesko? Or you are a pro independent, you are a pro ZANU PF and uh, independent candidate, so to say. I'm glad that there is that confusion amongst people. It shows that they're independent. Because uh, you, you cannot be seen to be on one side. We must understand one thing. Uh, ZANU PF is the governing party. There is no debate on that. And there are policies which they have, which they've promised the people which might be implemented. So I have high regard for such uh, an institution. Because tomorrow it will be the MDC Act. Equally, I'll give them the respect accorded to them. We do take off as members of parliament to be able to represent people. In representing people, it's national interest. And uh, that must be known and must be understood that I cannot behave like the opposition who have their issues with the ruling party. I cannot behave like the ruling party which has its issues with opposition. Mine is to drive national interest. And if you look at my debate and my representation, is about national interest. If you look at the, cause, the, 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 the issues of corruption, I tackle. It's national, national interest. If you look at the Chilonga issue, for example, the recent one, it's national interest. If you talk about human rights violation, it's national interest. And uh, that, to me, is what is critical at the end of the day. I've matched with the opposition in terms of the corruption when the late Morgan Sangirai was still alive. I've matched with the opposition in terms of Idzai Zamara missing. And uh, I've also supported the land reform that ZANU-PF came with 
And I've also have supported the Indigenization Empowerment Act, which is supposed to be pro-development, pro-empowerment initiative <laughs> for everybody. So when you look at those two uh, comp comparisons, they're all to do with national interests at the end of the day. I'm also able to be able to talk and to be also to be able to debate on, uh, on, on matters in Parliament which I believe are of national interest. And to me, and I've always said this, sadly, the MDC has got a lot of capacity in terms of people who are able to debate. If I'm not mistaken, they're sitting with 16 lawyers. Okay, and Zanin Player Club has got five lawyers. So in terms of capacity, I think they must, they must engage themselves more so that they're able to deal with some of the issues which are sticking, the reforms that we, we, can, we can talk about. The Electoral Act, if it's not in order, you're able to deal with this. Constitutionalism, you're able to deal with it because you've got people with capacity within you to be able to do that. But you also cannot do that when you are now walking out of Parliament when the President is in there because he's the head of the three pillars of state, Parliament, Judiciary... Is, and it, is, it, is, that, is that act not an act of uh, uh, legitimizing the issues that is at core? Because the, the MDC has, has always been arguing that uh, he was not legitimately uh, elected. So hence they cannot agree with him as the head of state or the head of those pillars that you are now purporting that they should be representing or respecting. Is that not one of the major core issues that the opposition has been speaking about? To say we do not recognize him as a legitimate leader. So he cannot be addressing us since it legitimizes the whole process. But there is an electoral act. The moment that you get into parliament, you are under the president. He's the head of the state, and the state is three pillars, parliament, judicial, and executive. So you're contradicting yourselves. From day one, they were not supposed to walk into parliament. They're getting taxpayers' money. And that, in a way, already legitimate. In fact, it goes a step further by people thinking that you're only in it for the money. And also, you need to understand that there are certain uh, 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 statutes in place, procedures in place of challenging the election. The Constitutional Court is there. They went before the Constitutional Court. And at the end of the day, the Constitutional Court ruled otherwise. So to me, what is important is to carry on. What pains me the most is that the MDC MP is at about 1.6 million. Nelson Chamisa went to about 2.1 million, which is unprecedented for any leader of any party to get half a million more than his own party. At the same time, Zanupia had two-thirds majority in terms of parliament. But the president had 50 uh, point, uh, zero 0.08, which is also something which has never happened before. So you now see that at the end of the day, if they focus on more people, they certainly have a way of finding themselves into the corridors of power. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let me just cross uh, quickly to you, uh, Honorable Tema. Uh, these, these are the issues uh, that uh, Tema Ulisco raises of pertinent, uh, these are pertinent issues of greater importance. Uh, do you, are you not in self conflict if you then don't recognize Menangago, but you are recognizing the systems that is put in place, specifically uh, the parliament that you're talking about, but you don't then recognize him when it comes to the parliament? I think that's a very pertinent question that is just put through there. I, I think that we need to put this into um, this proper perspective. There is what we call legal legitimacy, and there is what we call political legitimacy. Uh, the issues that uh, Honorable Mliswa is referring to are issues pertaining to legal legitimacy. Legitimacy which is bestowed by a court of law, whether it is constitutional court, etc., etc. But when it comes to political legitimacy, political legitimacy cannot be bestowed by a court of law. Political legitimacy can only be bestowed by the electorate. It is a belief system. Do people believe that this person who is governing us won an election? Okay? And if they say that they do not believe this, there's, no, there's nothing that a court of law can ever do to that. It's an issue of trust, it's an issue of a relationship between the governor and those who are, who are governed. And the issue that the NDC Alliance has put on the table is an issue of uh, political legitimacy. When it comes to the issue of uh, them working out uh, uh, in the parliamentary session or, or elsewhere, you have to talk about the issues of uh, the rights which uh, individuals have to politically express themselves. You've got freedom of expression, you also have got freedom of, of movement. If uh, Honorable Mliswa 
feels that it does not want to be in Parliament today because so and so is speaking. It's within his rights to be able to express himself politically by saying I am I am I am walking out. And, and that is normal in any in any in any democracy. And it must not be seen in any other way other than a democratic expression of a wish. Uh, Honorable Minister, let me just quickly switch this uh, back to you. Uh, what's your view on this topical issue uh, that questions the legitimacy of Emerson Munangaga? Do you think that he was legitimately elected as the president of Zimbabwe? I, I, I'm very clear on this. And like I've said, that I've, I've taken off to, uh, to represent the people of the country. Emerson Munangaga uh, won the election was announced, then there was uh, a dispute with them spilled to the Constitutional Court. The Constitutional Court ruled. When the Constitutional Court has ruled, that is the final court of the land, and that's the decision. For me, one of the issues that you must understand is the dialogue that we talk about, Poland, is not new. As Zimbabweans, we must be talking all the time. My brother here, Tiba, we talk all the time. We don't have to be able to have a fight in election to talk. When you're building a country, it's a process. The generation's coming, they've got to talk. So it's not unique and it's not special. It's not a one-off event. It's a lifetime issue. It's like husband and wife married and then one house. They never stop talking about issues. So why do we make a big issue of Paul at the end of the day? It only shows that we were not talking, which was wrong. Now we've started to talk, but engagement of political leaders must constantly be there to show that at the end of the day, we are one Zimbabwe. The issue that Honorable Timba talks about in terms of one's right to walk away, I tend to differ with it. To me, I would rather debate in Parliament, move a motion, and say but the President was not legitimately elected through the debate. To me, the capacity that the opposition has in, a, in being able to debate is far more than any other political player that you can talk about. They've got brilliant people in terms of their legal mind, they've got brilliant people in terms of debating, more experienced, and so forth. If you talk about the, the likes of Tendai Biti, if you talk about the likes of Job Sakala, if you talk about the likes of Pulu, uh, 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 you, know, you, you can go on and on and on, Amil and Demel, and so forth. They are marvel to think, listen to. In fact, I always say to people that the reason why I sit on the opposition side is because I'm able to tap into their legal uh, uh, brilliance because I'm not a lawyer and I'm not going to go to university now and get a law degree when BT is sitting next to me and Scala is sitting next to me. I tap into their pool of legal mind which then drives things forward. So, yeah, you, you, you haven't really answered my question. Uh, just, I want to understand you, your perspective. Do you believe that Nangaga or President Emerson Nangaga was legitimately elected? Because that seems to be a point of quotation from the MDC. You see, to me, as an independent player, to me, he was elected. He is in power, and there was legitimacy. Any doubt to that? It was telling you through the Constitutional Court. That is the reason why I have respect for the office of the president. There is a difference between the office of the president and the individual in Emerson Nangaga the leader of ZANU PF. That is the reason why, at the end of the day, I focus on criticizing their policies and their manifesto, which they promise the people. The people that they say will be employed right now are not employed. The people who they say there will be better health care is not there. The people, when they say to the people there will be better schools and infrastructure development, it is not there. When they say they will care on corruption, it is, it is quite report. Mm -hmm. When they talked about human rights violation, it is quite report. When we go to the 17th of November 2017, consensus by the people in moving forward in one Zimbabwe, is it projected? No, it is not projected. And why are we not there? When the former late president of MDC Changra was alive and came through, it was out of sincerity, out of genuity. When the late Dumiso Dabengo also came through, it was out of sincerity and genuity. The current president was in South Africa. But while people put Zimbabwe first, they all knew that Emerson Nangago would come in as president, but also hoping that there would be change and not betray the people as we see now. Let's go back to the 17th of November, when there was not an election, when it was the People's March that ushered him in power of all walks around the country. But this is not what we are seeing today. Then came an election. So even before he was elected, why did they not dispute that? 
Why did they march, knowing that Emerson Nangako was going to be president? Because there was goodwill. There was some expectations in terms of the direction the country was going and the course where it would change. Uh, this one is quickly shifted to you. Uh, there, there, there seems to have been uh, this uh, euphoria that finally we are getting the new dispensation. Do you feel that the MDC as a party slept on it or celebrated the, the rise? Because it was obvious constitutionally uh, on the 17th of November that Emerson Mnangagwa was going to be taking over or, or Zan PF was going to be appointing a leader uh, uh, after the removal of, 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 of President Mugabe. Uh, as Temba Munizko, Honorable Temba Munizko clearly says here, uh, what, what, what went wrong? Did you put your horses right? And was it very clear to all the uh, uh, opposition parties that the, the ruling party was going to appoint someone? Or maybe at the back offices there was an agreement to have some sort of a, a unity or, I don't know, a pact between the political parties? Because that seemed to be a national event which unfortunately culminated to be a political event as soon as uh, President Emerson Nangaka took over. Your sentiments towards the takeover issue? Yeah. Let me start by saying that um, I think that there was consensus that uh, um, um, Robert Mugabe was no longer fit for purpose. Uh, and, and that consensus was national. Uh, but let me also underline that there, there was an expectation and a general understanding that uh, uh, post that there was going to be a new arrangement where some form of a transitional mechanism would have taken place okay, to fix our country before we go to, to an election. I, I will take you to, back to what is on public record. What is on public record is that uh, 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 Honorable Chris Mtwanko to come out clearly and openly to say, we know we've been working with everybody in the country, including the opposition party, and Honorable Shinabasa stood up and said, no, 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 no. Uh, the, 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 this is an unfair thing. And when Honorable Mutabwa said, no, no, that was never the understanding. That is not the understanding. So that conversation indicates to you that the expectation that was there caused the departure of Mr. Mugabe was some form of a, a transition where people could have then sat down to say, what do we do from here? How do we take our country forward? That did not happen. And that to me represents a, a form of betrayal that, that took place after that, um, after that time. I still want to go back to Honorable Muliswa. Honorable Muliswa still continues to mix two things. He still continues to mix the issue of political legitimacy and legal legitimacy. The Constitutional Court restores legal legitimacy. Okay? And they did restore that to Mr. To Mr. Munanga. But what you're talking about here is political legitimacy. The ability for a leader to be able to stand up and say, you guys, we're going to be tightening our belts for the next three years so that we can fix A, B, C, D, and then the population follows it. Right. And that, uh, that's political legitimacy. Right. If they don't do that, then that leader elects political legitimacy. And political legitimacy is important in the governance of any, any country because if there's no political legitimacy, what you create is uh, you create a crisis of confidence in a country. You create a crisis, crisis. People do not trust their government. If their government stands up and says, you know, we are going to be doing A, B, C, D, and then people act in the opposite way, mm -hmm. which demonstrates to you that there's a trust deficit between the government and those who are governed. Those are the issues of uh, political legitimacy that we are talking about. Right. And the presence of political legitimacy in any given politic then body politic then leads to uh, performance legitimacy gaps. That the country can now no longer perform, the, 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 the economy is not responding well because there's no confidence in the processes that are, that are taking place. And that's why you start hearing people to say, let's sit down and dialogue. Where would you want to dialogue? If you are saying that this person uh, legitimately won an election, if he legitimately won an election, he must govern. Mm -hmm. But if people are saying, no, 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 for things to move forward, we need a consensus. We need to be able to sit down and agree and say we are doing the same thing. You are talking to issues of legitimacy, political legitimacy. And that political legitimacy can bring confidence in a given body politic. And then probably the economy will start to oh. well. it, it seems we, 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 are, we are all discussing about this issue of talks and uh, discussions. 
uh, but they, it seems to be technical names that are being used here. Uh, we can have a political discussion or a negotiation. Uh, on album list, you're talking about polar discussion, they've always been there. Do we need a polar discussion or we need a completely different political discussion to move them over forward? Should we, should we be talking about people going to Poland or there needs to be a separate negotiation that needs to be done by political parties thereof? I'll start with you, Honorable Munizo. You know, first of all, you've got to give credit to my sister and brother. Uh, you know, they think went to school before went to school and they're very good English teachers. <laughs> and, 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 and I like the way he, he think unpacks the uh, legal legitimacy and the political legitimacy. <laughs> He's come with terms which are uh, Exciting and you know, and are you clear on those and, ones? And, 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 when are, and when you are smart and probably you've done all the work I've done, you must give respect to good work, <laughs> which you really, even if you argue, you cannot win the debate. But to say that, you see, like he said, it's freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and right to his views. So those are his views, and I will not debate on his views because his views win the debate. But what he's basically saying at the end of the day is that the politics are about people. But at the same time, how do we then qualify leaders? It's through the ballot. Okay, so that political legitimacy still has the ballot. Failure to which you then challenge it through the constitutional court, which is the legal framework which is there. They were part of crafting the constitution. And to us, it's also important to go back to it and say, the constitution we have, the electoral act we have, is this what we want? You know, I have, if you follow my tweet today, I called it half time. Mm -hmm. That every coach at halftime has got to make certain changes. Right. Okay. And Zimbabwe is at halftime now to see that the government <laughs> that we have, okay, is it going according to what the electorate expects? If you are the coach and you are with Chelsea, Abramovich is the owner, he's watching, uh, you perform as a coach, his team is losing. Okay. And ultimately he has the say to fire you. But in politics it's the people. So half time, let's review, where are we? And this is where I think we must be at this point and say, we are probably extra time, over time in half time. Half time, what is the coach saying? What is the CEO of the country saying to us? That is the reason why I say to my colleagues in the opposition, my colleagues in parliament, may we invite the president to parliament to come and respond to issues because constitutionally he's allowed to do that. They say the opposition also coming, asking the very questions are you a legitimate leader? Let him respond to that. We feel this and that did not go well and so forth. There is a platform for us to talk about that. And that's parliament at the end of the day. You, can, you cannot have different strokes for different folks and so forth. Zimbabweans, this is half time. How is the team playing? <laughs> and what changes need to be made? And does the coach understand that failure to win this cup final definitely is out? There is a generation which I've been talking about which everybody is ignoring. The demise of Chamisa of the opposition does not, does not relate to Zanipiev being victorious. If Zanipiev becomes victorious, it is able to govern, deliver the promises, and the question is, are they delivering the promises? Are they implementing the policies and so forth? So for me, I see it as immature politics every day because you cannot govern without a strong opposition party because you become ineffective. It's the same thing as you running a 100 meter race on your own and you win. And at the end of the day, nobody claps for you because there was no crowd. Yeah. So you must be able to have a vibrant opposition. You don't destroy it. A vibrant opposition causes the governing party, the ruling party, Zanupef, to be able to stick to its mandate of delivering every day. So to me, this is where the political maturity should be. At the same time, we're on the ground. I've said it, that the generation of 18, Honorable Timber, to 29 in 2018, okay, will bring the change. Okay? Because every generation wants to detect its future. It wants to have young generals. It wants to have one young ministers and so forth. The 2013 election of the youth vote according to yard statistics, which we did, were 5% 2018. In 2018, after I spoke to the late Tangera, he said, political parties don't have the ability to mobilize independent people because most of the voters, as honorable symbols agree, are independent. There's no party which has a structure we can win an election. So now you have in 20, in 20, uh, uh, 18. The youth vote in 2018, from 2013 to 2018, the youth vote went up to 30%, which is highest in category. Yeah. 
No one is paying attention on that because there's no one an analyzing. This is my forte. That's why I've had young students come. So in 2018, you're looking at over 50%. And they're likely to dictate who the leader will be. They've not been to the struggle. They're unemployed. Uh, they don't care, but they are also wanting to associate with a young person or a leader who is going to advocate the, the, the goals of the young people. Watch this. 13 years in 2018 to 29 years in 2018 is the one that will decide. Not only that, people who are usually under 50 are categorized in youth. So you have a generation which got us independence, which is slowly fizzling out, death, and so forth, and they cannot be given a second chance to work. But you've got another generation which is coming through, which is calm. Zimbabweans have one tendency. They speak once, and they speak after five years. And I can tell you, when they speak, all this about the military taking over and so forth will, will not happen because the same thing had happened on 17 November when people marched. The military had to be the army of the people. The police had to be the police of the people. There was no violence at all because the people decided to lead and to direct. And as a result, the people's army was involved. No wonder why we, I agree with them. The motion to move the impeachment was first put to parliament by Honorable Maridad. The people don't know that. The second, there was me. Okay. But it was not flying through because of, of certain issues. But when then it was right, Honorable Mchango from the upper house was the move of the motion and they had to talk to me to withdraw the motion and Mary Daddy became the seconder. Zimbabweans, can you think about that? Zanu PF moving the motion, MGC seconding. Were we drunk at some point or were we so dead dummy? These are the issues that we must talk about and challenge our leaders with their conscience. That leaders, listen to me, sit down now and tell us that where we are right now, is it what the people expected? Is this what you expected? Zanu PF cannot single-handedly deal with the problem of Zimbabwe when we all agree that 37 years we suffered. Institutions are dysfunctional. The, brick, the bureaucrats have not changed. I was hoping that the inclusive government would have four cabinet ministers from the MDC. Uh, you, you had uh, Chamisa, you had Kupe, you had Monzora, and so forth. You also have others that you pick up, Prisla Misaira, and be coming in, and so forth. But as you are testing and feeling the road, you are able to then understand where it is. The JNU was a success. The late President Mugabe, no matter how tough he was, he had to realize that we needed to work with people. And in terms of performance, probably that was the best uh, government ever. But credit then went to, to Zanu PF, who then won the election in 2013. But my dear brother and his party also had taken a position not to vote because of certain reforms that they wanted to, and that slowed them down. Right. Do you, so do you think at this moment it's time for us to start thinking about another, dis another political dialogue or another uh, GNU or another political talk towards the power chain, so to say? There's no point in that. Let's go to the people's consensus mm -hmm. of 17 November. What were we expecting? What were we promised? If, if that's not the case, it's the betrayal of the people. And uh, people who know leaders who betrayed them, who they want them to be in power again, that's up to them to now decide. Because you cannot bluff people twice. Mm -hmm. Once beaten, twice shy. I want us to go back to 17 November. Right. The new Zimbabwe, we all agreed. The Zimbabwe that we knew that Comrade Emerson Nagako would be president. The Zimbabwe that we knew there will not be willy nilly of people being arrested because they're expressing themselves. No matter what, even if I attack the Minister of State Security, Owen Muda, I don't, you don't have to use state apparatus on me to arrest me. It's too heavy. Let him sue me. There are, there are ways of saying, Honorable Melissa, what he said is not true. You need to be sued. The fact that uh, Hopewell has said what he said, look at it. But there are different strokes for different folks. I was uh, 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 people like Elias Mambu, who are journalists with the Morning Post, wrote a lot about me. Mm -hmm. I reported to law and order. They've not been arrested. I've been accused of wanting to bomb the president with uh, Susan, mm -hmm. to me that is more important than whatever happened. White House, let's, White let's, let's, let's have that discussion uh, on the second break. We need to also speak about this. I'll quickly jump to Honorable Timber, just before we check our first break. Honorable Timber, there seems to be a new wave of political dialogue, which obviously to you does not resonate with the poll that ongoing. Do you think that Zimbabwe needs a political dialogue? 
what we are saying is that um, we need a new consensus. What we are saying is that um, we need uh, a new convergence. Um, as a party, we are saying that uh, we need to go back to the citizens who are the owners of this country. Let's bring the citizens together in a new convergence, in a new conversation about the future of this country. Beyond what we think as individual political parties, let's bring an all stakeholder forum where citizens can participate in discussing and determining their, their issues. So, as a party, we are advocating for the citizens' convergence for change. Citizens will be able to come through their various representative groups to talk about the Zimbabwe that they want and the Zimbabwe that they deserve so that we can have a shared vision. In this, uh, in, in this country. We have difficulties with uh, um, what I might want to refer to as partisan and or monologue arrangements as represented by, 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 by Poland. And, and, and my difficulty uh, arises out of uh, why Poland was uh, put together in first place. Poland was put together to say, uh, um, let's come sit down and we contested each other in the last election. Therefore, the membership of Poland was then restricted to those who participated in the election. But if you look at that membership and then you look at the dispute that arose in 2018, the two key, two key disputants in that election were Mr. Emerson Munangabo and Comrade Leader those were the disputants mm -hmm. to that election. Therefore, you cannot bring non disputants to a forum to discuss and negotiate what and then talk about what. Because they already, they're already in agreement. They're already in agreement. So they're, they're, there's no difference for them to be discussing. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a waste of taxpayers' money. If I recall in the last budget, was it last year, some $80 million have been budgeted for. for these uh, compatriots to spend taxpayers' money literally doing nothing. At the here now, they are demanding that taxpayers should buy them vehicles and should give them diplomatic passports and, 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 and so forth and so on. For what? For, for what purpose? Take that money and give it to the informal sector. Take that money and give it to the informal sector, which has been shut down during this whole lockdown period when big business was operating. Let's put that money to good use. Put, give income. Uh, 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 give sorry, give a relief fund to to the former sector rather than go and buy their uh, for those uh, compatriots of ours who are pretending to be dialogue to resolve Zimbabwe's uh, uh, national crisis. Indeed, we have a crisis of governance in this country. We have a crisis of legitimacy, and this crisis goes beyond the current dispute started way back in 1980. Okay. We've had a cycle of disputed elections in this country. And unless we address ourselves to the fundamental problem that we have in this country, that how do we come up with a system that allows a democratic process to take place so that we don't have a disputed outcome in our elections, that the winners and the losers are able to shake each other's hands and then move on together. We do not have that. That's current crisis that we have. So unless we we break that cycle, stop that cycle, the crisis in this country will continue. And I look at the persons in this studio here, the majority of you are young people. It is your future which is being stolen because of this dispute. And unless we address ourselves to this dispute and to this crisis, that crisis does not end. <clears throat> So thank you so much to all of you who are watching us live. This is www.tegmec.tv. We are taking a short break as we are discussing Zimbabwe political situation and the way forward. Is the Zimbabwean opposition political parties being captured uh, by the ruling parties and PF? And what next? And what is the best way forward for Zimbabwe so that we move from this current economic doldrum? We'll be back after this short break. <laughs>
and of course thank you so much all our viewers for joining us back live right here this is the second segment that we are discussing with zimbabwe political uh, players here as we see way forward is the zimbabwe political opposition player has been captured uh, by the ruling zanu pf and what next for zimbabwe let me just quickly jump uh, back to honorable timber Zimbabwean opposition, specifically the MDC, the main opposition political party, many people are saying is now dead and buried because ZANU-PF has managed to lie in bed uh, with the MDCT. Unfortunately, the MDCT is not here to respond. We had built them to be here, they promised to be here, but for some reason they are not here. And I, 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 I wish there was somebody else who was going to be able to answer for them. But needless to say, uh, Honorable Timber, uh, the ZANU PF has been blamed uh, to take over MDC Alliance and has propped up MDCT and this MDC Alliance dead and buried because of this uh, strategy that ZANU PF has played on your political party. The concept of a one party state is in the DNA of uh, ZANU PF. You can go back in history uh, uh, since uh, um, after, immediately after independence, where ZANU PF went on an onslaught to decimate ZAP. Uh, it also involved eventually some extrajudicial killings that took place in Matabalele. And all that was aimed at decimating an opposition force in the form of uh, uh, the former Liberation Party, uh, ZAPO. Of course, the 1987 uh, Unit Accord, there were efforts, and at every turn uh, uh, in Parliament, the then Prime Minister, Mr. Robert Mugabe, would stand up and say, now that uh, the two main parties have united, um, is there really need for any other political party? They started moving the agenda of uh, legislating for one party state. Some of us were still young people then, and we stood up and we fought them. We fought them so hard that there would never be a one party state in this market, and we succeeded in restoring multi party uh, democracy. That included even supporting a liberation icon like uh, Edgar Tekere, whom we worked with to stop the legislation of a one-party state in this, uh, in the, in this country. Uh, so it has been in the DNA of Zanapia that they do not believe that there should be any other voice other than theirs in, 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 uh, in our politics. Uh, there has been a deliberate attempt by the Munangagwa regime to decimate uh, uh, opposition voices in this country. And uh, the strategy has been two pronged. One, co optation, which means you co opt an opposition component and you decimate the other. So the idea was to construct a client opposition in the form of the NDCT using various state institutions, including Parliament, which was used to unlawfully allow the recall of people's representatives were elected during an election. People went to the polls and the elected representatives who were carrying the symbol of the MDC alliance. Parliament allowed this, presently and openly, to withdraw, unilaterally withdraw, the people's mandate by withdrawing those uh, representatives. It happened also in local government. Uh, 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 Honorable July uh, uh, facilitated the withdrawal of elected councillors throughout the country, I think the number around 45 or so, people selected to represent. You cannot play around with the mandate of the people because the authority to govern does not come from a Speaker of Parliament, does not come from a Minister of Local Government. It comes from voters. And before you act on it, you really need to sit down and think, do I have the power to withdraw this mandate? No, you do not. And that has happened. But these things, you have seen the way in which our head office was, 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 was taken over with, with the support uh, 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 and assistance of state institutions. We literally uh, hounded out out of, out of our headquarters in, in, in broad daylight. Uh, using, that was an attempt to wanting to decimate the MDC alliance because they are clear in their minds that they do not want to see uh, President Nelson Chamisa on the ballot paper. In, in 2023, they do not want to see anyone representing the MDC alliance on a ballot paper. So there is a deliberate attempt to decimate. But let me be clear to you and, and, and very clear. All these attempts will come to naught because they do not understand that a political party is not a building. They can go and take away our building. They can go 
poem, literally, hound out our representatives. What they cannot do, there's a space that they can't reach. That space is the hearts and minds of the people of Zimbabwe. The people of Zimbabwe are not stupid. They've seen what is happening. At the end of the day, when the opportunity comes for them to correct it, they will correct it resoundingly and say, this is what we want as, uh, as people. So yes, there is, there's been an attempt to, to co-opt and create a pliant opposition and to, to decimate uh, the, uh, uh, the real people's representatives. But, but the MDCT says that uh, constitutionally, if they were given power uh, by, uh, by the Supreme Court. Or the constitutional court, the people that serve. He, he, he has also clearly explained to you in November 17, people say this is what is good. That's what happens. So uh, if anyone believes that they are operating and leading a political party because of a judgment of uh, two or three learned people sitting on a bench, then I think they are not in politics. They, they, are, they are somewhere else other than politics. In politics, that authority resides with the people and with the voters. Uh, let's uh, switch back quickly uh, <laughs> to the major topic of today's show, the independence of alternative voice. Honorable uh, Timo Minister, a lot of people have called you a ZANU-PF uh, personnel who does not choose to be within the structures, but uh, rather you want to run ZANU-PF outside as an independent. Your independence uh, as, a, as a candidate has, has been questionable, and you seem to be much more uh, aligned to pro-ZANU-PF uh, policies, uh, and, and uh, in some latest recording that we, we wish we would have talked talk about, you seem to have been advising the president, uh, Emerson Mnangagwa, and how could you be a credible opposition or independent candidate, yet you, are, yet you are seem to have been advising on best strategies uh, as a political player. How, how do you respond to that? It's a very, very pointed question that you bring up, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to the point of viewers and hope that they understood for as long as the PF, the ruling party, is not functioning, the country is dead. So we expect us to be able to be critical of the PF. Honorable Timba will tell you that politically they say that the party is supreme to govern. So if Zanu PF is in a mess at Sheikh Sheikh, if they are failing to conduct DCC elections, where there should be 120 executive members, but average is 40, 50 in an election. It talks about them no longer being popular even within their structures. This is what I expected, and you, by the way, you said I'm giving advice to Zambia. <coughs> Let me also give advice to the, to the opposition through this analysis. The DCC elections were a clear example that Zambia within itself is not popular in terms of internal democracy. 120 people are supposed to vote. At most 50 people average vote. Where are the other 70? They have no confidence in the leadership which is there because the leadership which is in the provincial structures, in the central committee, some of it, in the political, was, was appointed, not elected. You've got to understand that internal democracy must be followed for you to be able to have a proper structure nationally. That is the reason why I attack political parties and say, but you are the mothers of disorder. You are the mothers of violence, because violence does not start at national uh, level. It starts at political level, at grassroots level. So there is nothing wrong with you saying to Zambia PF, may you go this way, so that the country can be run properly. And I say so because I am independent. I say so because, true, the only party that I've ever known uh, is Zambia PF in terms of having a position. But my father was Zap. But because of the unity accord, I became Zanu PF, so I want to speak for myself. I was a central committee member of Zanu PF. I was a provincial chairman of Zanu PF. I was a DCC chairman of Zanu PF. I was a secretary for lands in Zanu PF. I was a Zanu PF in London. So I've been quite consistent, and I understand Zanu PF. I understand how it operates at the end of the day. It would be unfair for me to also know another mother that has never given me milk. It, that's common sense I'm speaking. Is it, fair, is, it, is it fair then to say one Zanupia, always Zanupia? Let me, let me say this. It depends which Zanupia. Not this one. 
And they have been very clear. I thought you'd be asking me why are you not supporting this Zanu PF? This Zanu PF, I don't know it. Most of the people in these churches never understood Zanu PF. Okay, the Zanu PF of the Mugabe time is different from this one. Most of these guys have used their money to be in the political arena. This is why democracy in political parties is being destroyed. The real hardliners like him are not there because a young man comes, buys elections, wins, but there is no ideology in driving the party forward. This is what has destroyed political parties in this country. So if you look at the DCC elections, you go as a political party, you go and disseminate nine provinces out of ten. You fire ten, nine provincial chairpersons elected by the people. You then replace them with those people appointed. That is the reason why the intelligence of this country, CIO, is always not sure of what I'm doing in Marsh West because the people of Marsh West still talk about who they elected as their chairman. When they see me, they say, chairman, say, how are you? Zian Zian was not elected. He was my vice chairman. He was removed by the late by, by Chombo for me to be out of power. So you cannot tell him to have the control of the people. That cascades down. The constitution of Zanipia talks about if two thirds of the co of the members are co opted, the structure dissolves automatically. They have not done that. That's the reason why the president is not able to get many people except for Masuingo, where you've got Chazanil and Matuki, Chazanil was elected in terms of mobilizing people. Some of these rallies in, the, in these provinces have not yet people. He has suspended them. It never happened before. Because the leadership which is there is not entrusted by the people. So we must be able to understand that, that we are there to ensure that there's democracy. Honorable Timba is here. I will talk about the elephant in the room. 129, 129, uh, 1K of the Constitution. He will tell you, whoever came up with it in the Constitution, that is the one that gives them, the political parties, the power to recall. Because if a person different somebody, you recall them. You see now MDCA would recall this one, MGCT is recalling this one, and to me, that is being abused. Allow the people to dictate. That's why I'm moving a motion in Parliament to say, no, there must be... A, a way of expelling people which must end up with the constitutional court to ensure that the due processes were followed. People are being suspended at the Zanipef political meeting. For example, the Zanipef political meeting is not the principal organ of the party. The principal organ of the party is the central committee. We should be able to ratify what the political is saying. Mm -hmm. So it's unconstitutional, but you cannot challenge that. Okay, because they say to you, if you challenge that, you cannot challenge the party and so on. I have challenged my, my expulsion from Zanu PF with my uncle Didmas Mtasa. We said it was unfair and the procedures was not proper, but the Supreme Court, the Constitutional Court ruled otherwise and so forth. So let us be very clear in terms of the, the organs and in terms of the Constitution and so forth. It is the same thing as the criteria for education. Why are we having people who don't have a basic education to be leaders? Because the party constitutions themselves don't have that clause. Mm -hmm. So you just look at somebody who's 21 years old, who is a registered voter, who is a citizen of the country, and has, com has not committed a crime. So we, as the electorate, too, have a lot to blame. The electorate is the one that ushered this constitution in. At times you laugh at us in parliament to say, look at what they are doing. But it's a reflection of the people who voted for us, the, the, the reflection of the constitution which is there. I want to go st a step further and say that the issues which Honorable Timber brought to the fore are critical. Are critical in that never underestimate the power of the people. And because you are not punching back, it does not mean you cannot punch back. Nelson Mandela said this about Holemisa. Holomisa used to attack him, and he got up once and said, this honorable member has been throwing blows at me, and I've been, I'm still standing. The day I decide to throw a blow, will he stand? So don't, uh, don't mistake a silence, okay? meekness, a politeness to be weakness. Okay? Don't mistake a the opposition being quiet and nobody saying anything and you being the only one to be witness. The people of Zimbabwe have started the politicians here. They know when to speak. No wonder why by-elections are not popular. Because people vote. Look at Zanipef in the by-elections in 2013. They swept all the thing in town. Come 2018, they lost. They vote once. They prepare themselves. They have the tenacity. They have the patience. But they keep watching. 
And ultimately, God is watching. We are a country, we are a religion, Christian nation, which ultimately believes in God at the end of the day. Zanupeth has failed to even look at the welfare of the war veterans. Okay. They have complained. Their benefits are next to nothing. The wives and the families of the provincial heroes and national heroes are paupers today. You now have a situation where the biggest national security threat is within the security sector where they're paging themselves. Where does the povo come in into firing CIO officers, army guys, and, uh, and police? Where's, once you fire a lot of them, you're creating a security threat because they're likely to come up together. Mm -hmm. I'm not in the security sector, mm -hmm. but they are paranoid. Paranoia is going through because ultimately, at the end of the day, they are not getting the result that they need instead of us one reconciling. Zani PF talks about re-engagement. Re-engagement before you re-engage your own people within Zani PF. Before you re-engage your own countrymen. Let us put our people first. Let's have priorities when we're dealing with this thing. That's why I've called it half time. Mm -hmm. Let's talk. You must have a half time show now yeah. where people can start <laughs> reflecting and viewing and you also hear what the spectators are saying. Same no way. wonder why the spectators get up and say, substitute him, mm -hmm. substitute him. Because they have a say. Mm -hmm. And any clever coach at times is forced to change a player. Because the players have said substitute. If not, they start walking out of the stadium. Right. And they're waiting for the next match. Correct. And the next match, you don't find anybody there. Let us respect the will of the people and let's not think people are stupid at the end of the day. I've said it. Because the opposition is quiet. And the other thing is that let's not overrate the Zanu PF. Let's not overrate the security. There are people, they breathe. Mm -hmm. Anything that bleeds dies. So because they breathe, there are people too. Okay. At a certain point, you cannot use the security against your own people. Because one day, he will be pointing a gun at his brother. Will he fire? No, he will not fire. Mm. Interesting. You, you, you brought up a very interesting uh, uh, issue while you were discussing, where you actually said that you even challenged the ZANPF system because they, they'd actually gone against uh, internal, uh, internal structures by firing you via, via, via the Police Bureau. I want to understand something, Honorable Minister. Do you think that Zimbabwean judicial system is independent or is still uh, being driven by certain political offices? Uh, how do you rate uh, the independence of the judiciary in Zimbabwe? Because it seems it seem as Honorable Temba and you, you are all in agreement that you have got political disagreements, but when it comes to the Supreme Court judgment and the High Court judgments, they seem to judge otherwise. Do you believe in the independence of the judiciary system in Zimbabwe? Let me tell you one thing. If, you, if you've worn a shoes for 37 years, it's likely to also wear down. That's the same with the institutions in the country. That's all I can say. <laughs> when I put in about the independence of the Zimbabwe judicial system, you seem to have a big battle, not a political one, but a judicial one. How, how, how do you trust them? And uh, what, what's your pers uh, pers pers sentiment towards the independence of a judicial system? I think I would want to talk about the independence of what I would call the Chapter 12 institution. In this country. Chapter 12 of our constitution outlines the various independent uh, institutions that we have in the country. Judiciary is an arm of, uh, of the state, like legislature and, uh, and the executive. One of the key uh, agenda items of Zimbabwe, Agenda 2021, is uh, the reform agenda. On the reform agenda, we are basically saying that we need to reform the way in which our institutions are operated. We need to be able to ensure that all our institutions, which are supposed to be independent, are operated uh, independently whether it is the judiciary or it is uh, an executive commission of the state, they must be able to operate independently. We can only protect ourselves as citizens today and tomorrow if we strengthen our institutions. I'm sure you, you, you saw what happened in the United States of America. They tested their institutions. The institution, the institution, the institution, the institution which stood the pressure okay, and be able to. That's where we should be. That's where we should be aiming to do. We must do, let's not create institutions in the images of a current politics. No. We must create institutions that outlive politics, that outlive individuals. That's the only way in which we can guarantee the future of this country. To answer you straight, Tonio, I'm not entirely happy with the manner in which certain decisions have been made. I'm not entirely happy with what is happening, for instance, 
at our next course. We have seen the way in which people have been denied bail, which is which is a right. I mean, the person is presumed uh, innocent, okay, and, and and they must be able to be given bail. We we have seen how people have eff effectively been serving sentences without trial uh, through through being remanded in custody. So we have seen how the MDC three of Joanna. Uh, Syria and, and the side have literally been abused. If you just look at these ladies today, just look at them, they are traumatized. They do not feel safe in their own country. Who is going to protect them if state institutions are going to be going after them? Those things are not good for this country, and those are some of the areas that we would like to see uh, uh, us uh, reforming our institutions. This is the kind of conversation that I believe we must help as a country under our citizen uh, convergence for, for change. We would like to look at our electoral system. We, do we have the, an electoral system that can guarantee undisputed outcomes? The answer for me is no. Okay, and, and we need to have a conversation about that. It's not about MDC, it's not about Zambia, it's not about my good brother, um, this way here being an independent. It's about us as a country. Let's create those legal instruments, let's create those institutions that can protect all of us. Strong, independent institutions that, 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 that are not controlled or captured by any political party. You see, we talk about the, the Second Republic. I have questioned myself, and uh, one thing I taught myself was not to be quiet when uh, <coughs> things go wrong. My father always said, speak up so that one day you are able to say me, Baba, on this day I told you that I right, but Makadai. So I continue to speak to a point that no matter how much persecution I'm under, I'm here. I'm now prepared that while I come here, I've got my check suit in my car, I've got my PPEs so that when I'm detained, I look forward to the police coming in again, stopping us here. <laughs> so once you now have a culture like that, one in I've been arrested over 78 times. Do you think it will hurt me? I actually feel that sorry for the person arresting me. So you know, you now create monsters who, who you cannot deal with at the end of the day. When you are saying the Commissioner General of Police has, has violated the Procurement Act you write properly, may be investigated. He believes that he must send the police on you. When you say the Minister of State Security has been taking over mines and killing people, that's the biggest national security threat. I have said to the service chiefs, you went to the struggle, we respect the struggle. But we must also see people in certain strategic positions who are part of the struggle, so that the decisions that they make are not about enhancing their Korokosa game. The Minister of State Security for the first time was never in Zapu leadership, he was never in the Zanu leadership during the war. Neither was he in Zana, neither was he in Zipa. Okay. All those service chiefs that you see, uh, P. Visbanda, Chimonyo, uh, Moyo, uh, Matanga, uh, Komet Opam Chinguri, all those are people who were in the struggle as political leaders and they were respected. When you become the Minister of National State Security, look at the current President E. Dim Nangabo, the caliber of Minister of State Security, Sekeramai, Did Masimtasa, Kembo Mahadi, Nicholas Goch. And then, oh, Muda, Kuma, and Muda. You now see it being disseminated. State security is critical. He hasn't got the, the, the capacity intellectually. When you talk about CAI, FBI, Scotland Yard, and so forth, what is it? We have said we cannot anymore have a situation with people who are. That's a longer deal. It's about. People being selfish who are in partnership with Dan Derry, July Moyo using a statutory instrument okay, for corrupt activities. Devolution is being given out without the provincial councils sitting down, but yet there's a sitting allowance which are being given to provincial councils. Where are the minutes? There's the aspect of oversight. There's an aspect of accountability of that money, but you're channeling it to companies which are benefiting from. At the end of the day, central government, you are also in cahoots with the very same councils who you say are corrupt, who is the mother of corruption. The land barons, who is the godfather of the land barons? Who is the mother of the land barons? It's a talk show. The land commission is done, nothing is done, no implementation, and so forth. You cannot seriously 
think that a country can move forward when we are not able to see the truth that Niswa says, Timber says. You cannot move forward when you don't recognize the following that Chamisa has, whether you like him or not. Bring him to a table, have a coffee. He becomes a key Zimbabwe in many things. Let's all reason together, like the good, say, good Lord says, for the good of the country. But Victor Hugo, in my closing remarks, says, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Mm. Let me just conclude by saying that uh, you cannot destroy an idea. You can only disagree with it. The MDC Alliance is an idea whose time has come. And to all our viewers who are watching us, it's, we've been having a very interesting uh, discussion here uh, with Honorable Chairman Mbiske and Honorable Jameson Timber uh, discussing Zimbabwe politics, what next, and has the state managed to capture Zimbabwe political players? Unfortunately, because of time and other commitments, uh, these two gentlemen that we have here, they have to rush for the next commitments. We're going to be doing this each and every week. Uh, please do make a date with us. This is www.techmec.tv. My name is Tonio. It's a pleasure to have you guys. Let's do this once more again next week. Let's share.